Okay. So good morning, or not good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mikhail Solomon. I'm the director of Prism Art Fair. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for a conversation with Dudley Alexis, Johan Rahman, and Nadej Green. Um, we will open the conversation with um, some comments by Monica Sorrell, who is a, a part of a film festival group here in Miami called Third Horizon. Um, and I just want to begin the evening by um, saying a special thank you to our event partners, um, the Knight Foundation, the Green Family Foundation, the Miami-Dade Department of Cultural Affairs, um, the Greater Miami Visitors and Convention Bureau, um, Mokata um, in New York, and um, and I think I think that is all of our supporters. Um, so without further ado, I will begin with a small bio um, by um, Miss. Monica Sorrell. Uh, Monica is a Haitian American filmmaker born and raised in Miami. She has produced and worked as a, as a department head on projects for film independent, A24, HBO, and PBS. Her latest produced project, T, directed by um, Keisha Ray Witherspoon has been selected at, at Sundance Film Festival, won the Golden Bear for best short film at Berlin 8, and won additional awards at Miami Film Festival, New Orleans Film Festival and Black Star Film Festival. Currently, Monica is a cinematic arts resident at Ulay Arts, where she is writing and developing her feature film directorial debut, Mountains. Monica is a member of Third Horizon, a creative collective dedicated to developing, producing, ex exhibiting, and distributing work which gives voice to stories of the Caribbean, its diaspora, and other marginalized underrepresented spaces in the global south. She is currently the Associate Director of Programs and Industry for their flagship initiative, Third Horizon Film Festival. Monica. Thank you, Mikhail. Um, so tonight we have Nadej Green leading a conversation with Dudley Alexis and Johan Rahman to discuss Dudley's feature documentary, When Liberty Burns, which is presented by Prism Art Fair and Johan's photographic series, Black Florida, and we're gonna be talking about the overlapping themes that these two works present in regards to archive, memory, and injustice in Black Florida, both yesterday and today. So before we begin, I want to take a few minutes to introduce our panelists. So first we have Dudley Alexis, who is an independent filmmaker and visual artist, as well as a cultural anthropologist and historian who sees his world through unique multicultural eyes. His mission as a creative is to mine the wealth of hidden details that provide meaning to the lives of those often written off by the mainstream, finding in their stories real treasure. His gift is in gaining the trust of others who then poignantly share their personal stories, often filled with tragedy and triumph. Alexis vividly portrays their drive to thrive and to live with dignity and equality in a world that would too often attempt to keep them marginalized. Born in Haiti, Alexis immigrated to the United States in his teens, attending high school and college in Miami where he began studying fine art. His body of work in includes a vast number of short documentaries, including stories about the First Nations Miccosukee tribe of Florida made while employed by Miccosukee Magazine. He went on to write, film, and direct and edit his first full length documentary, Liberty, Liberty in a Soup, completed in 2016. Liberty in a Soup, tells the historical significance of soup jumu, the national dish of Haiti, which commemorates the island's national uh, triumph against, uh, national triumphant independence from France, making it the first independent black republic in the Western hemisphere. Uh, this work, uh, When Liberty Burns, is on Arthur McDuffie, which he shot exclusively right after. And it was most recently selected and featured in the exhibition, I'm sorry, he was most recently selected and featured an exhibition, Kingdom of This World Reimagined, curated by noted artist Edouard Duval Carrier during last, last year's Art week, week as part of Art Basel. Johan Rahman is a Trinidadian born Miami based documentary photographer working in both film and digital formats since 2002 and founder of the ongoing documentary project Black Florida a living archive that examines shifting urban and rural spaces occupied by the black communities throughout Florida. Compelled by a lack of nuance in the media, 
Rahman started documenting these communities in Florida that mirror her hometown, the Laventil Hills of Trinidad, offering a snapshot of everyday moments. To date, she has covered over 40 communities from Key West to Jacksonville since 2014. Rahman's work has appeared in several media outlets, including New Yorker Magazine, Vogue, National Geographic, Hyperallergic, Slate, Jezebel, WLR in Miami, and WMFE Orlando. She has been published in Oxford American, Photo District News, Bloomberg, Business Week, and MFON, Women Photographers of the African Diaspora. Rahman has exhibited in group and solo shows in New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Malaysia, Switzerland, and currently in the US Embassy in Kigali, Rwanda. Rahman is a 2018 Elias Awardee and a 2017 Night Arts grantee. She's been nominated to the British Journal of Photography, Ones to Watch, World Press, Photo, 6x6 Global Talent Program, and PDN 30. And finally, Nadej Green, our moderator, is a storyteller, researcher, community archivist, editor, and audio producer based in Miami. Her work centers the lived experiences of Black people in South Florida. Her practice and approach to storytelling is deeply rooted in history and first-person narratives that explore and connect issues around housing segregation, climate justice, gun violence, health inequities, poverty, and displacement. Her journalism has appeared on NPR, WLRN News, and in the Miami Herald. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, please uh, mute your audio when you come in the room. Um, we will open the floor up for questions in about uh, 30 to 35 minutes. And so if you have a question, you can then go ahead and unmute and ask our panelists. Um, without further ado, uh, here, uh, give me, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our panelists. Nadege, go ahead and take it away. Oh, Nadege, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> Zoom life. Um, no, I was saying thank you to you, Monica, and thank you, Johan and Dudley. Uh, for being here with us on a Friday night. Um, I just wanted to jump right on in. And I, if, if both of you could just like really quickly give us like a quick synopsis of your work, uh, Dudley specifically on your film, When Liberty Burns, and Johan on the Black Florida Project. Uh, if you could talk about just the origin, like why, why tell this story, right? Um, Dudley, and then we can go to Johan. You're on mute, Dudley. You just pulled in a dash. <laughs> All right. Uh, pretty much, I started working on When Liberty Burns when um, a close friend of mine we, that we went to high school together was murdered by the police um, on, on the highway um, on I-95 here. So I started researching you know, the history of policing in Miami, and I came across the story. And at the time, I was working on another documentary, and I was like, so um, I was so surprised. Like, Growing up here, I never heard anybody talk about McDuffie. And, and from there, I started um, researching and, and started doing the project. Um, pretty much, um, you know, living in Miami, I wanted, you know, there's, there's something, you know, race is something Miami doesn't like to talk about. And, and I find out that, like, you know, the, the story of McDuffie kind of, um, I want to, in a way to bring the conversation forward and at the same time tell his story because um, you have a story of a man that's trying, you know, that's trying his best, you know, to live the American dream, but somehow, you know, uh, you know, you hear the stories, those, those stories so so often, you know, um, um, with police brutality and you know, social, you know. Um, and, and systemic racism, you know, will get in the way. So uh, I, I just wanted to bring the story forward and have my, have the conversation in Miami. Go ahead, Johan. Okay, so um, as uh, Monica mentioned in my bio, uh, the communities that I photograph really mirror the, 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 the home life that I had in Trinidad 
And um, I, I first started off doing the project, not as a project, but I was just photographing uh, to capture something that was giving me a taste of home. You know, I was homesick. And, um, it's, and that eventually changed from, it, it gradually became the project that it is today. Um, but initially it was just for me, it was to satisfy my soul, to give me um, that, to, to, to just fill that, that space that was empty from being um, estranged from my family, um, who, you know, they were all in Trinidad. Um, and uh, the project actually started in Liberty City and um, Little Haiti and then gradually you know, made its way to Pahokee and beyond. Um, for me, it's really important to, to tell these stories or rather to have people tell their stories um, because uh, South Florida especially is, um, it's predominantly, predominantly positioned as a Latinx community. Um, you know, it's that, that's the narrative that, that is driven. In fact, all of Florida is positioned as either Latinx or uh, um, positioned as a party town or um, Orlando, but rarely is it ever um, positioned as a black, as, as being a place for a strong black, black diaspora. And we have one of the largest diasporas in Florida um in you know in the US. So um the stories are extremely um relevant to um connecting you know the rest of the diaspora from uh the Caribbean and from um Af the African American communities and also from you know from Europe. Um, and that's my project. It's, you know, telling our stories or, or us telling our stories through our voices. You know, one of the things that I found and still find striking in both of your work is like really honoring Miami, uh, Miami's making, honoring Black Miami and making Black Miami visible. Um, anyone who knows me knows I'm obsessed with Black people. I love Black people. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida, went to school, was born in Little Haiti, went to school in Liberty City. So like, you know, I like there is this certain erasure that happens around Black narratives in Miami that um, certainly not as visible, right? Um, not that the stories aren't there, but a lot of the stories are harder to find, harder to come across, and, and certainly are not amplified or supported in a lot of institutional ways. Uh, uh, Dudley, can you speak to just how your work has, has touched on that visibility, right? And, and making sure that our stories are told, specifically Arthur McDuffie's story. Um, I think one of the things growing up in Miami as well, like I knew McDuffie's story because I think if you're in the Liberty City area in and around the Liberty City area, his story is definitely much more prominent, but it's not something you learn in school. Um, but can you speak to making sure that his story was visible in your, in your film? I think a lot of the past media coverage of Arthur McDuffie more focused on property damage, very much like what we see today with uprisings that are happening or like the end result, right? How people reacted to the fact that he was murdered and his and the people who killed him uh, were acquitted, but we didn't get to know him, right? The person, we didn't know his story. And your film certainly went a little bit deeper into his personal narrative. And, you know, we got to meet his family members through your story. Um, talk about like that concept of visibility. You know, I, this is something, you know, working with, starting working with the Mikasukis have learned like, you know, the history of Florida really, it's a, uh, uh, has so much to do with the black experience here. You know, you have runaway slaves coming in, 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 in into Florida looking for, you know, sanctuary, you know, among the Seminoles. And, and from there you have both, you know, in the 19, um, 
1910s, 19, you know, at the foundation of the city, you have both, uh, you know, uh, black coming from Georgia and, and, and from the uh, from the Caribbean, uh, all come together and build the city. Miami was a well-known jazz town, and 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 to see today that that history is completely the way people talk about uh, Florida today. That history is completely lost. And, and you can see it as the, is how they construct the narrative around uh, what Miami is. And, and through that, you get like, you know, uh, the Black Story getaways. And, and, uh, and of course, McDuffie is part of that. And, and I, was, I was making the film and, and I interviewed like around 25 people. And, and a year before the film actually came out, I had an edit and I was like, no, I don't, this is the, the story I'm getting right now. It's mostly focusing on, oh, that's saw this burning. It's, it's the same narrative. I, I wanted people to know who Mike Duffy was because there's a story behind why those things happen. And, 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 and I wanted to focus on that. Why, why, why we have so much pain and why, how, why we end up expressing it in that way. So, so people like to focus on, on stuff burning and, and focusing on, on, on the actual um, actual uh, bursts of anger, but they don't ask the question why, you know? And I, that's one of the things I tried to, to do in the film as to why they happen. And and I can I, I, I think the story of McDuffie tells us why, you know, you have, like I said, you have this man, army veteran came back home, trying, you know, become a successful businessman, you know, trying his best to live his life, but uh, he, you know, and and you, his life was taken in that way. So, so the the pain is not just McDuffie. It's because the black community felt it because that's the it's, it wasn't the first time they were experiencing that. It was that you know, um, it, it, the the McDuffie uh, the the riot and the civil unrest is is just an expression of it, but it's not what it is. And Johan, can you say more on visibility, um, especially Black visibility within the Florida and South Florida context through your work? I mean, I, I adore you from afar. Um, <laughs> you know, we don't contact, you know, we don't really like talk. We're not like personal friends. In my mind, you're my friend though. Um, but like, I, I love like the photos of like the MLK parade in Liberty City that you capture or the intimate photos of like elders in Pahokee. It's so, it's beautiful. And there's this like intimacy of just everyday life, but also like joy, right? Like when you see a church lady with her hat on, like that, that says something. Um, when you see a little girl with her barrettes, right? Like you see yourself. So can you say more on um, visibility through your work, especially like black visibility? Um, well, you know, it's when, when you, you think about, okay, so there's one example. Uh, I, I was contacted uh, back in 2016 by a young man who, lives in Fort Pierce and um, he wanted me to come to photograph his community and, and, and to show me around Fort Pierce. So whenever someone reaches out to me, I start looking, I'll Google the, the community or the city and go straight to the images. And I'll always look for, you know, Google black images uh, or, from that neighborhood or from that community. And the images are always about crime. Mm. So, um, you know, very early on, I, it wasn't my intention to, when I did the project to, uh, to, to change, to try and, 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 and tilt the, the scale on what you see when you Google black you know, people in or Black Floridians or Black Florida, um, and and you know the images of these of of Black Floridians. But when I saw in 2016, early 2016, the images that came up for Fort Pierce, I knew it was like um, 
tagging is extremely important uh, for images of joy, of, of dignity, of dignified Black people just, uh, you know, doing everyday things. Um, because those search engines are, they, they tell a different story of who we are. They don't tell a complete story. So visibility is not just, uh, for me, it's not just about photographing people and showing our dignity and highlighting who we are, just, you know, everyday people and, you know, movers and shakers and everything in between. It's also about changing what comes up um, online, what, what, what the stories. So now if, if you search the words Black Florida, you'll see images of my work on, on, um, on Google, as opposed to a majority of images of crime or, um, you know, yes, you know, there's the proximity to crime, but um, I, I, I use my work to focus on what happens in spite of that, what, what life is like in spite of proximity to crime. Um, and, you know, life is, is it's beautiful, it's, it's fun, it's, um, you know, we, we make, we really do know how to make lemonade. And my work is about uh, focusing and showing, um, you know, lemonade, what, what, we, what we've made with these lemons that we've been handed. I feel like a theme that has come across is like Miami's history, um, Miami's Black past. Can you all, excuse me, can you all talk about um, archives and the importance of archives in your work? I mean, Johan, I think you just kind of touched on that in a way is like disrupting, right? The algorithm of what is archived about Black Florida. Um, but can you all talk a little bit uh, more on just archiving what is in the archives, what isn't, and like the importance of, of archives and memory? Um, well, what we're doing is we're, we're creating it, right? You're creating it. You are, um, you're creating visual archives, you're creating audio archives. Um, we, we've been flooding, you know, the, the, the selfie is, is a part of the archive. Uh, you know, how we see ourselves. Um, one of the things that I, I try to drive home to people that anyone who is interested in doing what I do, I try to break it down to them how easy it is, how simple. You don't need a camera. You have a smartphone. Everyone has a smartphone. Use it. Photograph yourself. Um, you know, record the time, the date, the, the, the date, the, the, the place, uh, what you were doing, who's in the photograph. Um, you know, create, create whatever you're doing online. Turn it into your own archive. Um, and it's, you know, anyone can be an archivist. Anyone can be a, a, a family um, historian. Who, who better to tell your story than you, right? And, um, and so we're, we're all adding to, the, to the, the current archive, thank, thank goodness for, you know, the smartphone and for social media. We're changing that. We're, we're you know, we have images of, um, of, you know, Breonna Taylor and um, uh, George Floyd. And then you have these artists, uh, people like Shire, who would take an image and then just completely um, change it into something, you know, the, the, the new image that passes through time is now just something really beautiful. The story is still there, the context is still there, but we're changing the archive and we're, we're, we're constantly disrupting what the traditional problematic, uh, um, you know, uh, way archives have always acted uh, to erase us or to tell the story of who we are. What about you, Dudley? Well, uh, I, had, I had an interesting experience <laughs> making this really with dealing with archives. Um, what I what I saw when I when, I, when I, while I was doing the documentary, it's like I, I went to different archives here in Miami 
And when I said when I said I'm doing the project about the McDuffie riot, I was surprised how not well archived that story was. And the story that was so impactful about Miami, and it's hard to find any like you you walked into the archive, you said that's your project. And I and it's a story that's so impactful. And 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 there's hardly anything around it. And, and that's when I become conscious of how they decide to tell the story of Black people here, and and what they decide to 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 save as history, and what they chose to say. This is what you know we want the next generation to know. So, so it's interesting how I you know like the different Black leaders that were really impactful. You you read about in in in, in Miami. You cannot find photography of them. You cannot find stories around them. You go to the different archive and you go to the to the black archive and black archive is like, you know, is archiving them. I'm sorry to say, but it, even because the archiving wasn't done until before them, it's, it's a struggle for even for to go to the archive to even find some of the story you're looking for. So it, and I find it, you know, really, um, I don't know how to, the thing is, like, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to advocate to, uh, here about how to archive Black stories and how to bring in, um, bring, you know, where to bring, you know, people that have, that have uh, artifacts. A lot of them are artifacts now. How to bring them forward to archives. And none of that really, I feel, is happening in Miami and in general, and it's not happening to, in Black Miami. And, and, and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, Sometime in the future, we you know there's a place we can go um, where the the story of Black Miami is being told, and everybody you know those those stories like McDuffie and or or uh, for example, um, what's his name again? Oh, the 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 Black Millionaire from Miami. I forgot. <laughs> Dana Dorsey. Dorsey. And Dorsey. <laughs> go and actually. You walk into the archive, and there's some uh, a lot of information about them. And I, uh, yeah, those to me were really strange. Those were really strange. The fact those impactful people and and stories were not archived, and and you, there's hardly anything you can read about them. And the, those people all, almost are becoming myth and and legend when they were not. I guess the question. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Johan. Um, okay, so one of the one of my uh, one of the things that are really important in my project is to encourage people to hold on to their archives, not to hand it over to a place like a history museum or the Florida Memory Project, because uh, I've worked with people in in Wallaca, and they do a, a family day every year. And whenever they need photographs of Wallachia, they have to go to the state archives to purchase images of their community, of their, you know, their, their uh, ancestors who lived in Wallachia. And um, what, what one, of my, one of the elements of my project is teaching them to create the images like I created. And so after I've gone past through, they can continue doing it, but also at the end of the project to repatriate the images to them. So they don't have to go to an archive to get the images, but also to not hand their work over to their, not their work, but their family archives over to a museum or uh, you know, a, a, a place like the, the um, Florida Memory Project. Um, and yeah. I guess who you hand it over to, like it matters, right? Like yeah. democratizing archives. Like once I hand this over to you, will someone like me be able to access it or will this be locked up? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that you know, I'm, I'm happy you said because this is one of the issues I came across is I met, I met some people I was interviewing and they were showing me their pictures and stuff like they have. And, 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 and they were asking me, what do they do with that? And, and I was like, can you give it to your family? And my kids doesn't does want it. And then I try to hand it over to my kids. And I, I'm, I'm afraid my kids are going to throw it away. So that that's where, like, you know, I think there's, um, 
I think we have to educate ourselves uh, how important those, you know, those are because, you know, you have, it happens so many times. They pass away and the kids just throw all those stuff away. But, and, you know, uh, I think it's interesting yeah. when you talk about like what we throw away. It's also a question of like, what do we value? And, and it's not just individual families, right? It's even institutions. Like I started the Black Miami-Dade project specifically around archives around Black Miami-Dade where I collect like ephemera and old magazines and photos on Black Miami-Dade. And a good amount of the photos that I have in my personal collection came from newspapers, right? That places like the Associated Press, the Miami Herald, the Boston Globe, all of these folks who were documenting, who had photos of Black Miami and other elements of Miami, when they digitized, they gave away those photos or investors bought those photos dirt cheap from them. And so they're in Alaska and they're in Kansas and they're in these random places. Like I have over a dozen photos, original press photos of the McDuffie riots, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it also is like, what is worthy of saving? What is worthy of collecting, right? And I think the absence of Black archives in an accessible way in Miami-Dade County speaks to what institutions here think is worthy. Yeah. And then it posits yes. the question, are yeah. we not worthy? Yeah. Right? Yes. Um, and I think in, in thinking through archives, because I know we want to open this up to questions um, in a bit, I was speaking to, um, I was speaking to N.D.B. Connolly, historian N.D.B. Connolly. He wrote the book, A World More Concrete, which I just feel should be a Miami Day textbook. Everyone should read that book on the history of real estate and race and injustices in Miami Day County, um, on real estate and race in Miami Day County, how property and blackness intersect here. And one of the questions he asked me, you know, we're talking about Miami's black past and how that's often hard to find, or it's definitely not as visible as other places, but does Miami have a black future, right? Like what does Miami's black future look like? And so I thought that was such a powerful question. I give him all of the credit um, for that question, but I pose it back to you. Mm -hmm. What is Miami's black future or what does a black future look like? in Miami, Johan? Uh, hmm. Well, <laughs> for me, a Black future in Miami is a representation, not just in, uh, in the arts as artists or in, um, not, not, not just in, in the stories that we contribute, but in decision-making roles. I, I want to see us uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a large part of the population. I want to see us in, in roles and on, on, on boards, not just the token um, individual. I don't want to see us uh, in uh, these subordinate roles at all. What? Space. Space? Yeah. Like <laughs> okay. So yeah, you know, I, that's, I think that, and I think uh, that that requires all of um, Black Miami to fight for that, not, not, not just a few people. That's my vision of, of Miami's future. But it, what are you envisioning, Dudley, when you think Black future Miami? You know, this is a, this is a conversation I was having recently with uh with him you know my, you know who uh, produced the film with me and and the question you know we were at, at, at we were, what we were talking end up talking about is the future is always now and and we, and we were talking about black leadership in, in miami who is the you know in the black leadership in miami that's helping us shaping that future and and i feel like in miami right now we need to, uh, you know, our leadership, like you know, um, in um, in politics and how we decide the policies in Miami, at 
we need to take more control of that and decide our future. That's 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 the way I see it, and and uh, and and I feel like the the future is now is us to sit down and, and decide how we're gonna get to that future. You know, uh, and I, to me, I'm hopeful. It's, it's bright, and I feel like uh, what's been happening recently in Miami, how we. Um, uh, we, I feel like Miami, uh, a black Miami is being elevated to our storytelling, how we express ourselves, and 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 in many ways, the uh, artists and and uh, storytellers and help shape uh, help shape uh, how how you know leadership and politics and policy sometimes shape that future. So I'm really hopeful with what I've been seeing. <laughs> Is there anything else, Dudley or Johan, you may want to add that maybe I haven't asked, but that you want to touch on as far as your work go, or as far as the presence and visibility of just Black stories and Black storytelling um, in this space, in this town? You go, Dudley. You go first. <laughs> Um, I, I think it's, um, I think we, we have a role to play in making sure we're not um, treating stories in the way um, the white gaze does and, um, and, and that we are telling the stories that in a way that um, maintains dignity and uh, and to give you know to give that to give the storytelling back to the communities mm. allow them to you know for, for us to not not be mimicking um, the colonizer you know and telling people's stories in a way that um, that gives us some type of uh, authority. If, even though it is our story also, sometimes we, we can, uh, you, you know, so yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's just to, 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 to treat stories with, with, with as much care as if they were our family's stories. You know, I'm I'm happy you said that about how you know the white gets an influence and in, you know in our storytelling. Sometimes I feel like um, you know this keeps us even as filmmakers, as creators, to explore and actually actually who we are. And 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 I, I like to say so much of who we are get get influenced by you know by whiteness that's around us constantly, and we 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 do not. We felt to explore exactly who we actually are, and I think that's something you know. As creators, as artists, as you know, as filmmakers, storytellers, we have to be extremely careful about about you know how we explore ourselves. And I'm happy you said that because uh, that influence is pretty much everywhere. And how you know what this, what how they tell you what's a good story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was looking at uh, your documentary, I'll tell you the gentleman's name. Um, there was one clip that really stood out to me, and it was Frank Legree and his son in camera, and the, the video camera that was on them, and the little boy was just like, you know, cowering away from the camera. And when I saw that, I had to like take a pause and ask myself, I had to, to wonder if there are any images in my archive that look anything like that have i have i been responsible have i acted responsibly in my photography it, and i hope that i didn't have anything i didn't create anything um like that footage because that was the white gaze that's mm. you, know, you know the and um and it just disturbed me the, in the way that their cameras are always on us have always have historically been on us and I just, um, 
I had to really pause and and um, and make sure that I am being as uh, as as conscious to not do the same with my camera, not to. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know, it it was an important clip. So I'm sorry. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Johan? I didn't want to cut you off. No, no, no. You know that that you know that clip you know, when when I was and and to see you know how they stop focusing like how they focus so much on uh, his talking you know but they focus so much on the wife and um and uh, and the boy on the on, on the, the the wife and the son on the side instead of focusing on him. So I, that's one of the things I, you know, I was paying attention to. I was like, you know, you know, even using the clip, I was, you know, it's it, like you said, it's interesting to see how, you know, how they capture us and how, yeah. You know. Right, we are. Can you guys hear? My phone keeps going on mute. Um, <laughs> So we are going to open it up to questions. I'm going to read some of the ones from the chat. Um, question number one is, can't copies of archive materials be given to institutions without losing possession of originals for the family? Um, the short answer to that is yes. Um, if that institution has like a if they're requesting digital archives, right, that they're doing copies and such, there are versions of this that happen in other places. I do not know of an active version of that that's happening in South Florida. Um, oftentimes institutions are asking for originals and there are a lot of issues with that. Um, but yes, that that is possible. Uh, Johan or Dudley, did you all, did either of you wanna speak on that? I'm sorry? Did either of you want to speak on that? On giving copies to uh, local archives? Yeah, without losing possession of the original. Have the archives earned it? The right to, you know, um, the Black Archives is a different story, but they're not the only organization that's collecting archives in, um, of, of, uh, of in, in, in South Florida. So um, I don't know. I I like I, I go to so many people's homes and sit and look through their photographs, and uh, never once have I thought that I had any right to ask for copies or to to ask for the originals. You know, and I am I, I just don't feel like I I, I think. Too much has been taken away from the black community as it is. I think we're in a, in a place right now where we we need to just really sit with what we have, and um, and and think of, of of new ways to present it before giving anything more to institutions that are um, predominantly white. So, okay, the next question is. Well, not so much a question, but a comment from the Napoleon Jones Henderson, member of AfroCobra. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's amazing that you're on this call. Um, Napoleon says, the role of the image maker should be seated in a space of authenticity. It is our responsibility to expose and document joy and the rhythm of our lives it is really our responsibility and goal to tell our story. I maintain that we should be telling that story from our lens, a lens that is driven by passion and from a place of being. We, the image maker, must tell the story by gathering the story from the people. Their truth is the truth and not the truth from the perspective of someone who is not of the family. And family is not just blood, but rather blood is the community, the people. Love that. That is a whole meditation. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't know, any reflections on that, Dudley or Johan? I have nothing to add to that. That was beautiful. I mean, right, like just mic drop. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was beautiful. That That is a meditation. Um, and that certainly is, I think, something we should often consider. Um, let's see, we have another, I saw a question in the chat on what do you all think of the institutions and efforts in Broward to preserve the history of its black communities? I mean, I personally am not as plugged into Broward County. Uh, I don't know someone else. I saw Shire in the chat that you love what's happening in Broward. Um, Johan or Dudley, are you guys privy to the work happening in Broward and preservation? Not, not, no, no. I am I'm, I'm familiar with um, Emmanuel George's work as a filmmaker, um, you know, preserving or, or rather uh, helping to retell stories. But um, and then there's the uh, the, the, the African American um, Research Library, which is you know they've got a really nice extensive collection um but uh i'm not i'm, I'm not 100 percent uh, versed on, on all that's happening in broward on an institutional level more yeah, annual is amazing you know. and uh if you if, if you haven't been to the african-american research library it's such a dope place to go um it, it's a great resource Definitely. Um, another question we have is, question for each member of the panel, what's the story from Black Miami's history or even present that's worth bringing more attention to as a film or a photo essay? And they go on to say, thank you so much for this, so vital. Hmm, I gotta think about that. Uh, well, the one thing I like about Miami is it's the diversity of its Black population, you know, from the Caribbean, from the South, from, you know, and, and I think it's, this, is, this is something um, probably New York has, and my, you know, besides New York, I think this is something I love about Miami is that diversity. I would love to tell the story of that diversity, how, how, um, how the different uh, those different cultures like come together in Miami. Sometimes I find it I find it really interesting. That's a, that's the only word I can use. I find it really interesting. That's the one thing I love about Miami. You know, uh, is that the diversity of Black people that live here. That's something I really admire. Okay, um, I would say Miami Carnival. Miami Carnival is, um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's where the diaspora gathers and you see everyone's flags mm -hmm. and, and I, I, um, it's the one place where we just come together and um, enjoy soca. <laughs> like more than me, a Trinidadian <laughs> could enjoy soca, right? And, um, and it's not gentrified like a lot of the other carnivals in America. It's, I, I don't know how it's maintained uh, its identity as, uh, as a black event. And uh, you know, you see how Notting Hill and, um, and uh, what's the other carnival called? The Brooklyn Labor Day, how they've been gentrified. Um, I think, um, I think Miami Carnival has maintained that black DNA, which I love. I would I would love to see it um, uh, memorialized in, in in a documentary. It's 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 beautiful. It really is. I think one of the stories I would love to see, like on screen, is actually something I worked on as a podcast on Railroad Shop Colored Edition. It was a neighborhood in the 1940s that was displaced to build 
an all white school, Alpada Middle. So there were about just over two dozen families that lived in this predominantly black area of what we now know as Brownsville. And um, in the, one night in the middle of the rain, their home was taken through eminent domain. And I think the eminent domain stories that most people know in Miami is of Overtown, that Overtown um, was, you know, the families of Overtown were displaced for urban renewal to build I-95, but Railroad Shop was the precursor to Overtown some 30 years before. Um, and I, I just think the visuals of that could be really powerful to like reimagine Railroad Shop colored edition and, you know, just putting people's children out in the rain, but not, not necessarily the displacement of Railroad Shop, though that would be part of the narrative. I think like, what was it to live in a neighborhood like that, right? Where you had all these fruit groves and just like black excellence, right? Um, in a community that would ultimately be destroyed. I don't think there's a lot of like historical stories that are rooted in like just the beauty of black neighborhoods in Miami. And again, to what we were saying earlier that people be like, there were black people in Miami. Like people ask that all the time. Like when I travel outside of Miami, like there are like real black people here. Like this is the South South, right? Um, so I think orienting that story around like a, like big more stories on Railroad Shop Colored Edition in a visual way where you can imagine like, you know, these, these beautiful homes that folks built with their hands and the love that went into living in a neighborhood that would ultimately be destroyed because of the racism of the city of Miami and the Miami-Dade County School Board. Um, so anyways, that's like my random story. Uh, let's see, no, next I, question. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dudley. I was gonna say Dr. Connolly's book, it's just, if you just open that book, we'll tell you those stories one after the other. It's it, 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 just that book, it, it needs to be a documentary by itself, <laughs> you know? And 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 there's so many of those, those and and I'm happy you're bringing those stories of displacement that happened in Miami. So we have another healing comment from Napoleon. I love these healing comments in between the questions. Um, uh, he writes, "How do you live the dream in the midst of confronting a nightmare?" One has the master, the double identity of real and unreal. Taking control is always ours to exercise. We must do so with agency. Agency is yours and not someone else's to give or allow you access to. Agency is you. All too often, we look for our agency to be respected by others before we ourselves acknowledge our agency. Preach. You are your agency. We have to act in the affirmative and not react to the negative that is heaped upon us. Nice. That was beautiful. Um, the question after that meditation is, great work, Dudley. What's next for you film-wise? <laughs> Working on some projects, you know, probably a year or two from now, they'll be out, but, you know. That's all you got? <laughs> <laughs> I think the people want more, Dudley. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm working on something, you know, um, can't, can't talk about it yet, but working on some stuff and, you um, you know, All right, so works done. in progress. Work in progress, yes. All right, next question is, are there any plans for the documentary to be shown on public television, streaming services, or in school soon? When and where will it be more widely available? Well, we're, st we're still working on that. Uh, the plan is uh, uh, soon sometime next year uh, first quarter we you know it's gonna be it's gonna be available um that, we don't we don't know how yet but but sometime um in the spring we're gonna have it available and i guess for you johan how can folks uh better interact with your work um like what's the best means of you know finding black florida 
images and, and the work that you're working on? Um, well, this year has been a little tough for me, right? So I haven't been, I haven't been photographing um, because uh, it, my work is so intimate and it's not, it's, it's a slow project. It's not something that, you know, I don't uh, shoot and just run off. I spend time with people and uh, um, hang out with them in their homes. And, you know, we drive around in my car or, you know, I drive around in their car. And so when the pandemic hit, it just, made it impossible for me to be able to do this because I can't, uh, you know, we can't put each other at risk. And um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been, a, I've, I've been in, in, a, in a place this, in the past few months of uh, not really working on the project, but taking myself somewhere Else, taking myself out of out of uh, you know being in 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 Miami and feeling kind of stuck and not being able to get in the car and drive to the communities. So, um, if anyone goes to my Instagram, you won't be seeing uh, Black Florida in its uh, in its purest form, but you'll be getting a little a little trip inside of my head. <laughs> at this moment which is also black florida right but it's not it's not as stated as the project but um i'm gonna be back soon with it um but if you if you go a little further you know in uh a little further down through um past the you know the the the, the maybe back to uh march of this year and back, you'll be able to see images of the work. But yeah, maybe someone could drop in the chat, Mikhail, or, um, or Monica Johan's Instagram or, and, or Dudley's website, uh, so folks can keep in touch with you mm -hmm. if they feel inclined to do so. Um, I just added Dudley, um, a link to Dudley's um, website um, in the chat box. If anybody wants to go there, there um, on his webpage, there is a link to contact him. And there's also um, links to his social media pages. Um, so you can reach him. And Johan, what would be the west, best website for, for, for Black Florida, my, um, for your Black Florida project? So I could put it in the chat box for folks. Blackflorida.org. I know we're at the eight o'clock mark. Um, I guess, Monica, should I turn it over to you to close out? <laughs> No more questions? Um, I think there was one last question for you, Dudley, on how, how McDuffie's family reacted on being interviewed again. Um, how long had it been since they'd last been interviewed and was there any hesitance on them revisiting that pain? Well, that's, yeah. Well, uh, it was the first time the family was interviewed. Uh, some members of the family were interviewed for like in 30 years for the first time, some other members. And it was, it was difficult for the family. First, like when I contacted them, they didn't want to do the interview because one, I remember one other thing they said is like every single time somebody interviewed, interviewed me, um, nothing happened and they stopped doing interviews. Um, but you know, I sat down with them and um, with Femi and we convinced them, hey, 
we gonna do, um, you know, we're gonna try to tell his story the best that we can. And there was one thing um, that did, they, they asked me, I say, hey, please do not show um, pictures of his face. And then I was like, my goal was never to focus on the violence or against, because we already know that. And, 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 and the interesting thing is when they were watching the documentary, they say, oh my God, you didn't, you didn't actually show it. I thought that you were gonna show it. I was like, I was like, my my point was never to actually show that, and 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 they were they still thought I was gonna show um, uh, pictures of his body and stuff like that, which was in the, in the news here in the media, which I I thought there was no point of showing stuff like that, um, but they were happy when they saw the movie and and they did come to the premiere here, which I was happy about, and. And uh, yeah, and I'm still in contact with them, you know. And 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 they did, they did, I feel really good the fact that they did like the the documentary. You know. so. Time to get that documentary into the schools. <laughs> yes, yes, that's that's our goal. Actually, we I'm trying myself to to have like you know. Dead County Public School in Broward County, all the way, like you know, uh, uh, South Florida in general, to have this in in the schools. Um, I know we're about to wrap up, but I think it's fitting that we end on Napoleon's wise words because he is a beautiful soul and has been blessing us with these sermons in the chat um, and this. He says, this is a great and timely discussion. Johan and Dudley, your work is really strong. Document, document, document. Thanks for your work. Let's not let the old fashioned way screen and exhibit at churches, beauty parlors, pool halls, and everywhere we gather. Remember yeah. Oscar and Michelle and the others who came before. All this when we can gather again. Wonderful. Perfect. Beautiful words. <laughs> My heart. <laughs> um, I don't think there's any, I think that was the best way to close out a panel discussion. Um, I'm so thankful um, for all of you, for Johan, for Dudley, for Nadej, um, um, for, for Monica for, um, for programming tonight's evening. Um, I'm so appreciative of all the amazing comments and questions we had in the, in the, in the chat tonight. Um, it really made for a really robust conversation. And um, I learned so much about, about Dudley's work, about Johan's work um, that I didn't know before. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful for you all continuing the work that so many uh, practitioners have laid the foundation for you all are, are, are taking the mantle <laughs> picking up the mantle and, and taking things to to the next level um i'm appreciative as, as well for everybody who decided mm -hmm. to join mm -hmm. us this evening um uh, napoleon your comments were so so important uh to this conversation and uh i think i think um i'm i'm, in, I'm inspired by them as i'm sure uh, our panelists were inspired as well so if there are no other additional comments, um, uh, we would like to bid you adieu. Um, uh, just one other additional comment. Mm -hmm. We have another panel discussion that's happening tomorrow. It's a reading um, that we're doing in, in partnership with Yard Concept. Uh, we are going to be taking on the, uh, the academic, <laughs> the academic uh, uh, responsibility of analyzing Poetics of Relations by Edouard Glissant. So if you have time tomorrow, uh, join us uh, at noon. Um, and uh, that link will be available on social media as well. If you're on our mailing list, you should also have the, uh, the Zoom registration link in your mailboxes as well. Uh, so yes, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Everyone, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.